Welcome back. We're going to get into the Word of God. Order. Order, I say. It's the name of my title tonight. Let's open up with a word of prayer. Lord, we just thank you uh, for this time we come together. Holy Spirit, we welcome you into this place. Lord, come and speak to us. Come and speak to your people tonight, God. Come and reveal the word you would have for us, Holy Spirit. Lord, stir us up for your work, Father. Stir us up for the things of God. Lord, light the fire underneath us. Lord, we just thank you for this time, Lord, and we just give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So we are in continuing in the book of Colossians. I'm going to read uh, in chapter 2, verses 1 through 7 tonight. It says, For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words. For though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Now, if you remember, Paul here is in Rome, and this is a letter to the Colossian church. Um, A lot of scholars believe that Paul may never have even visited Colossus, but he kept tabs on them through um, Epaphras. Okay, if I'm saying that right. And, and he was one of his converts and, and, and associates. And um, a lot of uh, the scholars believe that he was that the church in Colossus, that he was the church founder and leader of that church. So Paul then through Epaphras um, has planted this church in Colossus. And so Paul here as the apostle, as the father, right? He is writing them and um, he is seeing a church that is walking together in gospel order. They are steady in their faith in Christ. They are abiding by the doctrine of faith. They are maintaining an honorable profession, and he is warning and admonishing them to stay connected to each other and to continue to be rooted in Christ and built up in the faith. Paul says, I am enjoying and beholding your order. And the Greek renders this as Paul declaring, I rejoice that I can see your order. And the Colossian church stood fast in one spirit, contended and strove together for the faith of the gospel. They fought the good fight of faith. No hardship could remove them from their station so that they were attached to the gospel and they were attached to one another. They were united and they bowed by each other. They served the Lord with one consent and they kept the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Paul wrote to the Ephesians in chapter 4, The very same thing that he was seeing in the Colossian church. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, besiege you to walk worthy of the calling with which you are called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And this is what he was seeing in that church in Coloss. And during this time, the church is infiltrated with false teachers. And he's seeing them and warning them that these things are coming and these things are outside of them. They're facing intense persecution from the world, from the surrounding society. And he's saying, stand fast in the faith. Oppose the false teachers and profess faith in Christ without wavering. This is what he is telling them. He is saying, you have been doing this. Continue to do these things. So then Paul here 
This is the outward condition, if you will, that Paul is seeing. He is seeing the unity. He is seeing the bond of peace. He is seeing them stand fast in the faith as a unit. And so this outward condition then, he is joining to an inner one, okay? Where he says, the solid hold of your faith in Christ. I'm rejoicing to see your faith in Christ. So there's an inner thing going on here. The solid hold of their faith in Christ. Their faith in Christ that has been made firm then is representing the steadfastness and immovable of faith in such a way that their faith was protected by a strong work from injury. What do I mean by this? The outward order that Paul was seeing and unity of the body then provided a great fortress for the inner development and strengthening of their personal faith. The outward order provided the strengthening for the inner. In Ezekiel 13, 5, we see this same kind of concept. Um, Paul talked a lot in military terms. Um, We know that Paul was a Pharisee. He knew Hebrew, and so he understood understanding scripture in Ezekiel 13, five, it says, you have not gone up into the gaps to build a wall for the house of Israel to stand in battle on the day of the Lord. What he was talking to here then is that the prophets were refusing to speak God's word. And so because of that inward faith was not strong, then Israel had gaps on the wall. So we see an inner faith Maintained by an outward order. So then, going through this, how do we as a church maintain this same order that Paul here is speaking to the Colossian church? First of all, to keep this same order, we must gather We're going to see this same idea that Paul told the Colossian church into the letter um, of the Hebrews. Um, We don't really know that Paul wrote Hebrews. People say that, but um, uh, the, the, the letter to the Hebrews, they don't think was written by Paul, but it has the same idea In Hebrews chapter 10, I'm going to read verses 23 through 26. It says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. And a lot of pastors stop there, but it's directly connected to verse 26. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. And what the writer of Hebrews is showing us is this symbiotic relationship that the strong unity, the cohesiveness of the brethren then provides the perfect atmosphere for strength, for our faith to be strengthened. And that connectiveness and the unity of the church working and living in one mind and one accord is that strong fortress fortress to keep that faith from falling away, to keep one from sinning willfully and falling away from the faith. These are directly connected. And right now, folks, The enemy is using fear and isolation to bring division to the body of Christ. And we need each other more than ever. We need the cohesiveness and the order of the body so that our faith in can be strengthened inside of us. Our faith in the body of Christ are congruent and in direct harmony. They are not separate. In Psalm 92, 13, it says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. 
This has the same idea. And this theme flows throughout scripture. So we need to show up. Do not forsake the gathering of the brethren. You have to show up. Why do you choose to obey some scripture, but not all? Here are some real statistics from 2019. Now, these are church studies that are done on large scales. And this one's from 2019. I tried to find the newest one. These are some stats. 60% of church members are inactive. That's more than half. A regular attender then attends three times a week, making up only 18%. The other 22% attend periodically. And I understand that some of us work on Sunday. My husband works on Sunday. We're working on Sunday. And maybe you work on Sunday. I want to minimize, minimize, minimize your job. And, and you have a job where you cannot get out of work. But it's interesting to me that a Muslim will not work on a holy day, but a Christian will not even ask. I remember years ago when I was at Target and I was going through the Target line and there was a Muslim lady that was checking out the woman in front of me and it's Target, you know, and they got food and all sorts of stuff. And, and this woman had some hot dogs with her other stuff. And so the Muslim lady uh, checked her out and when she got to the hot dogs, she moved away and another lady came through and um, touched the hot dogs and then put them in the bag and then the Muslim lady came back and I was just watching this whole interaction and I thought, well, isn't that interesting that a Muslim is so committed to their religion that they won't even touch pork and a, a, a member of the body of Christ, the, the King of Kings and Lord of Lords who shed his blood for me can't even show up on a Sunday. And people say, well, you know, you're, you, you guys are pastors. You have to be there. Well, I was in the workforce at one time. I wouldn't even take a job where I had to work on a Sunday. I didn't. I didn't take a job. I would say, I'm not working on Sunday. And sometimes I understand you have to. I'm not saying that, okay? But mostly what I see is people are just skipping out to go have fun. And our society, and those of you that are my age, nearing that 50 mark, if you're, if you're that age or, or more, you remember where Sundays in America were closed. There was a lot of restaurants closed. They closed down. Why? Because it was the Lord's day. That's when we worship God. That's when we serve God. And so they closed on Sunday just to honor the Lord. I don't think we realize that breaking the Sabbath then was a reason for the judgment of God upon Israel. In Isaiah 58, 13 and 14, um, Isaiah here is telling the people to repent and be restored. And part of this had to do with the Sabbath day. And he says, if you turn away your foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on my holy day, this sounds familiar, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy day of the Lord honorable and shall honor him, not doing your own ways, nor finding your own pleasure, nor speaking your own words. Then you shall delight yourself in the Lord, and I will cause you to ride on the high hills of the earth and feed you with the heritage of Jacob, your father. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. And I understand that we are not subject to the Levitical, the Levitical law, and, and, you know, even we're going to get into Colossians a little bit more where it says, let no man judge you in the keeping of a Sabbath day. But you really have to understand what they were doing when Paul said that to them. Because uh, when you look at the Ten Commandments there, the Sabbath is not uh, um, a ceremonial law. It was a moral law. It's one of the Ten Commandments. Exodus 28, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. The, the Ten Commandments, if you don't know that, are moral laws. So the Sabbath then was a moral law. So we are not required to keep the Sabbath as the Israelites did. And they had strict restrictions um, on the Sabbath day. Okay. But with every law of God, there's a spiritual application. 
The Old Testament Sabbath was the seventh day of the week, and to keep it holy meant to set it apart as different from other days by ceasing labor and and rest and to rest, but mostly to worship God and concentrate on the things concerning eternity, spiritual life, and God's honor. And the keeping of the Sabbath was a sign to the pagan nations that Israel belonged to God and a reminder to them of what he had done for them. And the Christian church, folks, has been meeting on, the, on Sunday for the past 2,000 plus years. It's a day that we set aside to worship and honor God and we connect to our brothers and sisters in Christ. And there are ordinances that belong to the church body, not an individual, and these only belong to the church body. Communion is one of them, and I'm not going to read this, but you can go read in 1 Corinthians 11, 17 through 31, that communion is not just between you and Jesus. It is between you and the body. That's why it says if there's any schisms in the body, if there's any division, if you're doing something without honoring the body, you can't take communion. You're sinning against the Lord. Baptism. Baptism's not just about you. It's a public display to the church and to others that you have died to yourself and put on Christ. It's an identifying marker now that you are not just one with Christ, you are one with the body. The tithe. This is for the church body. It's not your money to do with it what you want to, folks. And this is not about legalism. It's like, oh, this, this is legal. No, it's not about legalism. This is about a heart issue that desires to honor the Lord and desires to honor the body. And you have to examine your heart. Where is your heart in this? Are you selfish? Has pride entered in? As in what, 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 um, the Lord had spoken to Isaiah with the people saying, I will do my own ways and I will find my own pleasure and I will speak my own words. That was the same mindset as Israel. It is an individual, selfish, fleshly type of thinking. What if the pastor just decided not to show up? <laughs> But people do this all the time, even when they have made a commitment to serve. And we, we make commitments to one another. And the pastor, he'll answer for his part in the body, but so will you. And the gathering of the brethren says to a lost and dying world that we honor the almighty God and that Jesus is king and Lord and he is alive and he still saves and we will bring him glory. Secondly, to keep order, we must be decent and in order. (laughs) First Corinthians 1440 says, let all things be done decently and in order. Now it's interesting here in the Greek. And you know, if you listen to any of my preachings, I like to do Greek studies. If you listen to any of my Bible studies, I always go to the Hebrew and to the Greek. I like to study words. And so this right here, this word signifies a military order. Okay, so he says, I'm seeing your order. It's a military order. Such is observed in armies in battle array. So it's suggesting then that Paul Paul saw from a distance and heard what was spoken about them from others, that these Christians were good soldiers of Christ. They were enlisted under his banners. They kept in due order and rank and file an order of church discipline. They had regular officers, pastors, and deacons ordained among them who rightly performed their offices and had respect and subjection yielded to them. The ordinances of the gospel were duly administered. This is order, folks, and constantly attended on. The members of the church were watched over. Admonitions were given. Censures laid where they were necessary, and everything was done decently and in order, which was a beautiful sight and gave the Apostle Paul an uncommon pleasure. 
I'm going to read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Hopefully I can see this. I don't have my glasses on, but I have the large print Bible here. So, you know, you guys stick with me. That's why it's kind of far away. Okay, so starting in verse 27, it says, now you, are, now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, gifts of healing, helps, administration, variety of tongues. So he says, there's an order to things in the church. He says, I have an order. I have an order. Okay, apostle first, a, a prophet, a teacher, Miracles after that. So God had an order for things. Are all, are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. So we see here an order. And so what does this mean to us? Folks, we, you have to know your gift, know your calling, and stay in your lane. <laughs> Prefer others better than you. That's the calling. Submit to authority. Authority is of God. If you are not submitted to the pastor, you're not under authority. The Bible says not just to submit to your leaders, but to submit to one another. Submit to church discipline. A church that doesn't have discipline is not one that's in order. And stop causing division. Stop complaining. Stop grumbling. Stop gossiping. These are divisive. And in James 3.16, it says, For where you have envy and selfish ambition, folks, right? Because it's a body with multiple people working together, selfish ambition, there will be, you will find disorder in every evil practice. So now we see you have to have order. And when there's selfish ambition, where there's envy, where there's jealousy, there will be disorder and sin will abound. Thirdly, order must be in agreement. Amos 3.3 3 says, can two walk together unless they are agreed? So this inward faith then must be in agreement in order to strengthen the fortress that's surrounding us. So I, I, I wrote down this from a commentary, and this is really good. It says, they, they do not need to be agreed upon everything, right? We can agree to disagree on things. They must, however, wish to keep, keep each other's company, and they must be going by the same road to the same place. The application of the parable is very plain. The two, the two whom the prophet would see walking together are God and Israel. And his question suggests not only the companionship and communion with God, which are the highest form of religion and the aim of all forms and ceremonies of worship, but also the inexorable condition on which alone that height of communion can be secured and sustained. Two may walk together, though the one be God in heaven and the other be, on, be I on earth. They have to be agreed thus far at any rate that both shall wish to be together and both be going the same road. So then using this scripture being in agreement we have to first be in agreement with God that we are on the same road, going to the same place. And if we're in agreement with God, we have to be in agreement with each other. We can agree to disagree on things, but there has to be the same road and the same destination. Two weeks ago, I preached on what the faith was, okay? And there are things we must agree upon and things we can agree to disagree on. If we are going to walk with God, if we are going to walk with one another, the word of God must reign first and foremost in our lives. There can be no disagreement on God's word. It is unalterable. It is infallible. It cannot be changed and it must be adhered to. 
What does this mean to you? You have to read and study the scriptures. See, you don't know God because you don't know his word. You can't be in agreement with somebody that you don't know. In Acts chapter 17, verses 10 and 11, it says that, Then the brethren immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea, where they arrived. They went into the synagogue of the Jews, and these were more fair-minded. Now, um, some translations said these were more honorable than those in Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness and searched the scriptures daily to find out where these things were so. So, I'm going to give you some more stats. This is a breakdown of Bible reading in this 2019 study. Um, Those who do not regularly attend church are inconsistent in their reading and thinking about scripture. That was the main thing they found. 32% read every day. 27 read a few times a week. 12% 12% once a week, 11% a few times a month, 5% once a month, 12% rarely or never read the Bible. This is one in eight Christians, rarely or never read the Bible, one in eight. And those who attend church, I thought this was an interesting stat, those who attend church four times a month or more are more likely to read every day than those who attend less frequently. Jesus' prayer for his people was that we would be sanctified by the truth of God's word. John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. God, your word is truth. So among the churchgoers who read their Bible every day, 51% said they found themselves thinking about biblical truths during the day. That the Bible and the mindfulness of God's truths influences our thoughts, actions, and speech. And I can attest to this. And I think about this because when I see or hear something, and for those of you that don't know me, I read my Bible every day. I've been doing it um, ever since I've been saved. Uh, there there might have been one or two days over the course of, you know, 20-something years where I didn't read it every day. But the that you can ask my husband, as long as we've been married, I don't know that he hasn't seen me reading my Bible every day. And when you do that, everything you see, everything you hear goes through the filter of what does God's word say about this? Not what do I think about this, but what does God's word say about this? And Psalm 119, 165 says, Great peace have they that love your law, and nothing shall offend them. So you have no peace because you do not love God's word. You are offended because you do not love God's word. When you fall in love with God's word, when you stop watching TV and start reading your Bible, you will not be offended. The more regular the Bible reading habit, the more likely one is to attend church. That was the study found. The more regular you read your Bible, the more likely you attended church. The more that you attended church, the more you read your Bible. So it's not surprising then that those who read the Bible and attend church regularly look more like Christ and walk in agreement with his spirit and his word. Fourthly, the orderly are rooted and built up in him. So this same principle then that Paul is telling the church in Corinth, he's telling the church in Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 2, 19 and 20, 19 through 22. It says, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the spirit, being built together. So rooted 
then is in the past tense, implying that their first conversion and, f- and, and final grafting is in him. Okay, rooted is past tense here. It says you were rooted in Christ. So this is a past tense word in the Greek. But built up in him is a present tense, indicating a continual process. Okay, suggesting here another of the many sides of Christ's relation to the building. And it leads us to explain that this internal building up of the church communities as new members join it and cohere with it and also of the individual as layers of experience and spiritual character accrue in this life and walk. So it's this continuous building up of ourselves and one another. See, people read these and they say, oh, I'm building myself up. I'm being built up. It's individual. It's not just individual. It's collective. That why are we are being built up individually, we are being built up collectively. This is not just individual wording here. It's collective. And it's important to note the change in the tense here to that perfect participle expressing an abiding result. Thus presenting a continuous process of building. A building of not only our faith and our submissive personal reliance on the Lord, which would strike that root downward to stabilize, but build up that spiritual structure so it would make us continually more stable. So it's that root going downward the, the, uh, and stabilizing what is being built upward and being built up around us. That inner faith the order, the unity, the collectiveness of the body. Are you seeing a theme in Paul's letters to the churches? It's not about you. And lastly, abounding in orderly faith with thanksgiving. Paul says, abounding in it. In what? In that faith. Abounding in the faith with thanksgiving. Abounding. And this was a favorite word of Paul. It occurs five times in Philippians. And it's nothing short of spiritual wealth and its full employment therein, in your faith, regarded as that sphere or the sense of abundance, okay? That loyal reliance on the all-sufficient Christ was to be largely, fully exercised in abundance, expressing overflow thanks to God that you have been made acquainted with truths so precious and glorious. This abounding then, this is to be very plentiful, abounding, fully sufficient, overflowing In the faith, abound in the knowledge of truth with thanksgiving, abound in the grace of Christ with thanksgiving, abound in the gifts of the Holy Spirit with thanksgiving, abound in Christ's work with thanksgiving, abound in his love with thanksgiving, abound in his wisdom with thanksgiving, abound in his word with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord for your unchanging word. Thank you, Lord, for the high cost of your grace. Thank you, Lord, for the precious gift of your blood. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for my brothers and sisters in Christ who surround me and strengthen me and help me to stay firm and stable while that faith is growing up inside me. In Jesus' name. I want to invite you tonight that if you do not know the Lord, that you would submit to him, that you would drop to your knees right now and cry out to heaven and say, Lord, I need you. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and turn your back on the world. Turn your back on your sin and go running towards him. And I don't have the words that you need to say. My altar prayer was, oh, it was groanings. (laughs) Lord, 
He knows your heart. He hears you as you cry out to him. He hears you as you groan out to him. Let the Holy Spirit come into you tonight and minister God's word of life to you. Be born again tonight by the power of the Holy Spirit and start reading your word. If you're not near us, find a good church that's preaching the word of God and get rooted and established in it. That you will have brothers and sisters to sharpen you and to help you and to hold you up to keep your faith firm and stable in the midst of this chaotic nation that we're in right now. If you're far from God, just cry out to him. Come to your senses and just turn away and run back home. The father is waiting to receive you with open arms. And if you need any part of this word applied to your life tonight, apply this word. It doesn't do any good if you just listen and walk away and forget everything. Apply the word to your heart. Apply the word to your life. Where do you need to make changes? Where do you need to ask for forgiveness? Where do you need God to make you whole? Lord, I just thank you for this time, God, that you build us up as a church, God, that you would strengthen us in unity and in the bond of peace, Father God. Strengthen our church, encourage our church, bring us together and let us stand firm in the faith, strengthened in you, Father, rooted and established in Christ. We give you all praise and glory and honor in Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Don't forget, church on Sunday, we'll be sitting in the parking lot. Bring a chair. We'll have some chairs for you. But join us Sunday morning. Good to see you. Thank you.